Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our workers' training session tonight. We pray that you open our eyes of understanding. Help us, Lord, to know and to see and to understand what you are revealing to us. And we pray that this will become part of our lives, our habits, and our expression of obedience to your word in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at Psalm 133. And we're reading from verse 1 to verse 2 to verse 3. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head, poured upon the head, that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hammon, that is, that unity is like ointment, that unity is also like the dew of Hammon, or like as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there, in that place where the ointment was applied, in that place where the dew also fell, there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, even eternal life. Life forevermore is eternal life. As we look at these verses, they appear to be familiar verses, but there's a lot in each of those verses. It says unity or fellowship or love or togetherness among the brethren is qualified by two adjectives. Number one, it's good. There are some things that are good that are not pleasant. For example, you take medicine, and that medicine is good, but it's not sweet, it's not pleasant. You force yourself to take it. But it says, when we talk about unity, and about fellowship, and about the togetherness and the oneness of the brethren, number one, it is good. Not only that it is good, it is pleasant. There are some things that bring pleasure, but they're not good. They're not good for our spiritual lives. They're not good for our health. They're not good for our morals. They're not good for our future. They may be pleasant to the flesh, but they're not good, ultimately. And to say that something is good and at the same time pleasant, it isolates that thing as something special, as something unique, as something that you don't come by every time. And it then gives us in a way that comes with surprise how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And now it says there's an illustration. As you look at the whole of the nation of Israel, and you look at the commonwealth of Israel, and you look at something important, something essential, something indispensable among them, the ministry of the priesthood and the place of Aaron in Israel. He had to atone for their sins. He had to represent them before the throne of God. He had to a kind of make a um, sacrifice. Whenever a plague uh, broke out, they couldn't do without the office and the ministry of the priest. And he says the unity and the fellowship and the togetherness is like Aaron's ministry. And it is like the ointment that is poured upon his head. 
and he's talking about an illustration here of unity. And then it says not only that, it is not something that sorts at his head. He flows down to his face and to his beard and to his cut, even to the hem of his garment, which means it covers the whole body. The goodness we're talking about and the pleasure we're talking about and the indispensability we're talking about is for the whole body of Christ, from the head to the toe, and it affects everyone. And then it says it's like the deal. That is the dew that comes from heaven that will refresh vegetation, that will refresh everything around. And it says that when there's no dew, of course, there will not be rain. If there's no dew, there is no rain, there will be drought, there will be heat, there will be discomfort. And it says the unity is like that. It is like the dew that comes. It comes upon the high mountain. That's why it mentions Hammon. And then it comes upon the low hill. That's why it mentions the hill Zion. And it says whether we're high like the mountain Hammon or we're low like the hill of Zion, it is very important, indispensable, irreplaceable in uh, every life. The unity, how it brings the benefit to everyone. That's what he's talking about here when it says how good how important and how essential, how indispensable, how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Because it's there that God actually commands blessings. This uh, tonight, we're looking at the topic, the heavenly benefits of unity among true brethren. Among true brethren. As you go through the Bible, you are going to find there are false brethren. You look at the family of um, David, and you'll find an Absalom there, an Ammon there. And so you understand, it's not that everybody there are acting like brethren, the true brethren. And as you come to the church, the body of Christ, you'll find that there are also false uh, brethren. Paul, the apostle, said, I was in peril, in peril of the sea, in peril of the robbers, in peril in my, among my country and a peril among false brethren or a true brethren it says among these true brethren there is heavenly benefit of unity the heavenly benefits of unity among the true brethren three points we're looking at number one the pleasant unity through enduring love the pleasant unity we experience through enduring love. Number two, the precious uniqueness of excelling leadership. When he presents uh, Aaron to us, he's talking about his leadership. He's talking about his position. He's talking about his exaltation. And he's talking about the essential quality of his uh, ministry in the land of Israel. Number two, the precious uniqueness of excelling at leadership. Number three, the perpetual usefulness. We use the word perpetual because the deal, the deal was there in the Old Testament at the time of Gideon when he put the fleece there, let the deal come here, let the deal come here. And then in the time of uh, David, the deal was there. And when Saul and Jonathan died, the deal fell on them. And as you look at the farmers and you look at the hill and the valley, the dew also was there. You come to the New Testament, the dew is there. The dew is still there today. And in the night, the dew falls upon vegetation and upon the forest. And it makes it fresh. It takes the weariness and the dreary, uh, dreariness away so that the dew will bring freshness. That's what we say. It's perpetual. And a perpetual usefulness unto eternal life. Because there... He commands the blessing unto life eternal. Let's come to number one. Number one, the pleasant unity through enduring love. Pleasant unity through enduring love. Look at verse one. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. We want to consider number one, transformed for unity. We were sinners, 
we came to the cross, we became brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, we became members of the family of Christ, we became brethren, and it was by transformation. And that transformation is not to make us stay isolated by ourselves. I've got grace, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I have all that I need to have. I have the Bible is complete, I have a pastor, I have a church, I have everything. And in isolation, I can come by myself to the church and I can get everything I need to get from the kingdom and still make heaven. The Bible says no, we're transformed for unity. It's a transformed us so we can be one. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. In Jeremiah chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 39. Transformed for unity. In chapter 32 of Jeremiah, and we're looking at verse 39. It tells us here in verse 39, it says, uh, it says, and I will give them one heart. I will give them, the people who have come to God, and the people who have been transformed by grace, and the people who have come into the new covenant, I will give all of them one heart, that's unity, and one way. They'll be walking in one way, and it says that they may fear me forever. It's something that is not temporary. It's something that is not just for the initial experience. It says they'll fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. I'll touch them. I'll transform them. I'll convert them. I'll give them one heart and one way, and it is for their good. We're coming to Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11, I read from verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 11, transformed for the sake of unity and transformed so that we can be united together as the body of Christ. And I will give them one heart and will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give them and heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. It's talking about uh, grieving us one heart. He gives you the same kind of heart he gives me. He gives me the same heart, kind of heart he gives her and because we have one heart, we have one spirit, we have one mind, we have one doctrine, and we have uh, one goal, and we have one direction, and we have one Lord. It brings us together. Our transformation brings unity. And the result of that, we're coming to John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, reading from verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy truth, uh, that thy word is truth. And then he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so send I them into the world. I've saved them. I'm praying to you, Heavenly Father, Holy Father, sanctify them. And I want you to sanctify them so that they'll have the same vision. They'll have the same goal. They have the same perspective. And they will all go with the same focus and with the same purpose into the same world and do the same thing. Look at verse 21, that they all may be one. They all who are transformed. They all who are sanctified. They all that have come to me, they all that have operated in their hearts and have given them one heart, they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee. You know, this one is not superficial unity. This one is not a society unity. This is not uh, man-made unity. It says, as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, not one outside us, not united outside us. You see, the people in that built a Babel, they were united, but they were not in God. They were not in righteousness. They were not in the purpose of God. It's talking about a kind of unity that comes after we believed on the Lord, the unity of 
brethren, brethren in Christ. And it says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's the purpose of the unity. It says that they all may be one. That the world will believe that you have sent me. Let's come back to uh, Psalm 133. In Psalm 133, I'm reading from verse 1 again. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. To dwell together. And you want to underline that word, together. Together in unity. Together in unity. It's not a unity, a kind of unity that is in absence, in absentia. That is, uh, you know, stay where you are. I stay where I am. Because whenever we come together, we always have conflict. And we always have disagreement. And we always have differences. Therefore, if we're going to keep our unity, it is uh, better we stay far apart. When you're far apart, uh, then you don't see each other. You don't offend each other. And you don't annoy each other. So it's good to, be, to stay away. And we still believe the same doctrine. We still believe the same Bible and we still answer the same church. If they're coming for the combined service, I don't want to come because, you know, I always see things I don't understand and things I don't agree with. It says, no, the unity we're talking about is not a mental unity. The unity we're talking about is not a mechanical unity. The unity we're talking about is not unity at a distance. It's unity when we're together. The second thing I see there is together in unity. Together in unity. Come to Romans chapter 15. In Romans chapter 15, I'm reading here from verse 5 and verse 6. Romans chapter 15, we're reading from verses 5 and 6. It says, now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another. That's the unity. To be like-minded one to another. I try to understand my brother there, and I try to understand my sister there. They're thinking differently. They're talking differently. They're acting differently. And yet, we need to be together. We cannot separate. We cannot isolate ourselves. What do I do then? I come under their skin. How are they thinking? I think like they're thinking. How are they looking at things? They're looking at things from this perspective, and I make myself to look at things in their perspective. And when I come under their skin, and I look at things in their perspective, and then I speak their language. I may not speak their vernacular, but the meaning they give to words, I try to understand them. When he says this, that's what he means. When I say that same thing, I mean another thing. We might be using the same vocabulary. I say box, and he says box. And actually, when I say box, I'm using a verb. I say box that thing, punch that thing. When she says box, she says carry the box. And because we use the same word differently, and we use the same word with different meanings, we can't understand each other. And so I try to suspend my own understanding. And I look at her own understanding of the word she's using. And then I use the same word with the same meaning that my neighbor has. That's what brings unity. But as long as I stick to my way, and you stick to your way, as long as I say, when I say go, what I mean is go out. When he says go, what it means is go and visit somebody. I must understand what you are saying. You must understand what I'm saying. And so, according to this verse 5, that the Lord will grant us to be like-minded towards another. And then he goes on to say, according to Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6, that ye 
made with one mind and one mouth. One mind and one mouth. I must have your mind. You must have my mind. And both of us must have the mind of Christ. It's not just that, you know, we're sitting together. We might be sitting together and thinking different ways. We might be living in the same house and thinking you know, in different ways. We might have different affections and different persuasions and different drive and different desires and different aspirations our unity comes when we try to bring what we love to the center especially to the center of what christ wants so that we may all with one mind and one mouth glorify god even the father of our lord jesus christ one mind and one mouth it goes to let's look at first corinthians chapter one first corinthians chapter one and we're reading from verse 10 in verse 10 it says now i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that ye all speak the same thing ye all speak the same thing what's that talking about there are a lot of things we need to say you know going from repentance to all the way through resurrection and the rapture and there are many things in between and when i decide to speak on repentance he decides to speak on revival he decides to speak on restitution he decides to speak on the rapture he decides to speak on heaven and hell he decides to speak on the second coming the other one decides to speak on marriage Another one is talking about another thing. Although all of us are true in what we're saying, but we're saying at the same time, we're emphasizing different things. It says the unity we're talking about, togetherness in unity, that we're together in unity, that we all speak the same thing. Look at that verse 10 again now. I beseech you, brethren, we're brethren. There shouldn't be disagreement. We're brethren. There should be no pulling up and pulling apart. We're brethren. It says, I beseech you, I beg of you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that she all, without exception, ye all speak the same thing, that there may be no divisions among you. No divisions among you. It's you and I that will make that happen, that will just determine I'm not going to have any divided interest, any divergent interest from the church, from the brethren, from the people of God. I'm not going to have any divergent view, any divergent opinion from the people of God. That there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together. That's the word, that's the word. Perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment that's what the lord expects of us that we are together we are united it's telling us in ephesians uh, ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 21 ephesians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 21 in verse 21 here is what it says it says in whom all the building fitly framed together. That's the word, together. The building fitly framed together grows into unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together. That's the word, together. Unity together. Together in unity. And it says, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. For an habitation of God through the Spirit. We're together and we remain together and we function together. We're built together. It's like when you look at the wall of a building or the pillar of a building or the whole building itself. Well, the blocks are built together. There's one block there, another block comes on top, another block comes on top, and no block, of course, they don't have the mouth to talk. No block is complaining, I don't want to be in this position. I want to be at the doorway where people come in and they know I am there. Where the block is put, that's why it remains quietly. 
and remains supporting others and others supporting that block too. And he says, we're like that. We're building together. We're not complaining and we're not resisting and we're not uh, kind of uh, wanting to be, be in another place. We're building together to form a holy temple unto the Lord. It tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What if I do that? And my conversation is that it befeeds the gospel of Christ. And you do that. And he does that. And she does that. And we all do that every time there'll be unity because I take my thoughts from the gospel. I take my actions from the gospel. I build my decisions on the gospel. I build my aspirations on the gospel. I don't have any selfish interest or self-centered interest, but only on the gospel. That's the unity the Lord is talking about. Only let your conversation, your manner of life be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears that she stands fast in one spirit with one mind in one spirit with one mind not that you know one spirit is hot the other one is cool one is zealous the other one is lukewarm one is on the go the other one is retreating no it says with one spirit and one mind that she strive together striving together that's the word again together for the faith of the gospel one we're transformed for unity. Two, we're together in unity. I'm coming to Psalm 133. Psalm 133, we're looking at verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, true brethren, to dwell together in unity. The word dwell, dwell together in unity. There is a kind of symmetry unity. They are dead. They are buried. They are together. But they are not talking. They are not rising. They are not moving. They are not walking. Can we say they dwell together in unity? That's a kind of deadly unity. It's talking about dwelling together like husband and wife living together for a purpose. It's like parents and children being together for a purpose. It's like having a school and a class, the teacher and the students, they are together for a purpose. It's like the church, the church, the membership and the members, they are dwelling together, living together for a purpose. This one is dynamic dwelling together. This one is lively dwelling together. This one is purposefully dwelling together. It's not just that, yes, mark my name, I'm present. Mark his name, she's present. Mark her name, she's present. And we're all together and we don't talk, we don't pray, we don't listen, we don't say anything, we don't act anything out, but we are dwelling together. What do you think of a husband and wife that they are treating each other with dead, absolute quietness? The wife is not talking. The husband is not talking. Those of us outside their home, we think they are dwelling together in unity. Their quietness shows that they have something against each other. That's not the kind of unity to dwell together that the Bible is talking about here is dwelling together for a purpose, dwelling together. And let, let's look at this in Psalm 101, 101. I'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7. Psalm 101, reading from verse 6, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. The faithful of the land, the faithful to the calling, 
They're faithful to the word of God. They're faithful to the duty they carry. And they're faithful to the purpose of staying with me. And it says that they may dwell with me. That, and that he may walk, he that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. It's dwelling together to serve the Lord. It's dwelling together to go in the same direction and to go in the same calling. It's not just to dwell together quietly like we're dead and we're not doing anything. Look at verse 7. He that walketh the seed shall not dwell within my house. It doesn't have the same mind with me. And he doesn't want to have the same mind with the truth. And then he says, He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. We're dwelling together so that we can walk together. We can plan together and we can do something together, progressively together. Psalm 140, I'm reading from verse 13. Psalm 140, reading from verse 13. It says, surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. It's not talking of, you know, overlook the backsliding. Overlook the craftiness, overlook the sinfulness, overlook, uh, you know, the lies, overlook uh, the satanic action and satanic attitude. It's good for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's talking about those who are upright, those who are righteous, and those are the people that can dwell together for a purpose. We're not spending our energy in argument. We're not spending our energy in conflict. We're not spending our energy in solving problems that could have been avoided. We're saved, we're sanctified, we're righteous, we're holy, we're upright, and now there is a work to do and together we dwell together to carry the load. We dwell together to move the mountain. We dwell together together to get something done and we are righteous. I pray the Lord will cultivate this unity in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're looking at Judges chapter 18. Judges chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 7. I look at these people now as we talk about dwelling together. And let's understand is actively dwelling together. Judges chapter 18 verse 7. It says, and the five men departed and came to Leish and saw the people that were therein. How they dwelt carelessly. They dwelt at ease. They dwelt together, but they were careless. And then it goes on to say, after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secured. They were dwelling together, no plan. They were dwelling together, no work. They were dwelling together, no security. They were dwelling together, no activity. And there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame, rebuke them in anything. And they were far from the Zaldonians and had no business with any man. No transaction, no business, no vision, nothing, but they dwelt together. Look at verse 8. And they came unto their brethren in Zorah and Eshtaol, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that ye, we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and, beho and behold, it is very good. That is, the land is very good, and are ye still, are you standing still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. And when ye go, ye shall come unto the people secured, careless, just dwelling together. And they didn't have any activity at all, and no plan, no strategy, and to a large land. For God has given it unto your hands, a place where there is no want of anything, 
that is in the earth. It says, uh, did he do anything at all? No cultivation, no activity, and uh, nothing whatever, but he dwelt together. Our dwelling together should not be like that. Our dwelling together is to get something done. We're going to get something done. Look at Isaiah as we dwell. We look at our condition. We look at the conditions of the people. We, we uh, kind of uh, make uh, our uh, condition better. We improve on our condition and on the condition of other people. And now we're able to move on. And our dwelling together is an active dwelling together. And it's going to achieve purpose. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Then said I, Who is me? For I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves. They were dwelling together. Isaiah of unclean leaves, and the people of unclean leaves, and they dwelt together. There were similarities among them, but the similarity will not make them useful. And so I said, I had to cry out, and he said, although we dwell together, this is not the best way to dwell together, and this is not how to dwell together. There must be cleansing in Isaiah. There must be cleansing in the people. And then with that cleansing, we can dwell together in righteousness. We can dwell together in holiness. We can dwell together with purpose. And we can dwell together with passion. We can dwell together with strategy. And then accomplish something. I dwell, he said, with the people in the midst of the people of unclean leaves. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life coal in his hand, which he had taken uh, with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it on my mouth. It will, if we're all dwelling together in uncleanness, something has to be done. We're dwelling together in laziness, in idleness, in lukewarmness. Something has to be done. We're dwelling together in carelessness and lack of zeal and lack of passion. Something has to be done. It's not enough to just dwell together. We must have the might of Christ, the vision of Christ, and the strategy to do what he has called us to do and be dutiful in our dwelling together. And he laid it upon my tongue and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is put. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Everybody, send me. And so you see the importance of dwelling together according to the plan, the purpose of the Lord. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, and I'm reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 58, we're reading from verse 10. Here in verse 10, here is what it says, If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness as such noonday. Darkness will vanish from your life and ministry. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like the watered garden, and like the spring of water, whose waters fail not, and they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Amen? So, it's dwelling together to be dutiful. It's dwelling together to get something done, and thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. Amen. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breaches and the restorer of paths 
to dwell in. The restorer of paths to dwell in. That's what he's talking about. We're dwelling together for a purpose. We're dwelling together for a pursuit. We're dwelling together for an action. We're dwelling together for responsible activity. Now we come to point number two, the precious uniqueness of excelling leadership. The precious uniqueness of excelling leadership. We're coming to Psalm 133. And I'm coming to verse 2. It tastes like there's something that has been said earlier, and now it says that sin is like something else he wants to talk about now. What's he talking about? He's talking about unity. He's talking about togetherness. And he's talking about fellowship. And he said that unity is like or that fellowship is like or that love that brings us together dynamic and dutiful is like what's it like verse 2 it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Number one is talking about Aaron. Number two is talking about his garments. Number three is talking about the oil, the ointment that is poured upon him. And then it says that ointment went all over him and covered his whole body from the head to the garments and to every part. I want you to see the uniqueness, number one, of Aaron himself. The uniqueness, number two, of the garments. The uniqueness of the ointment, of the oil. And see what the Lord is talking about, that the unity he spoke about in verse 1 is a unique unity. It's a unique fellowship. It's not unity like you find any other place. It's not fellowship like you find any other place. And it is not a togetherness, dwelling together, that you find in any other place. Uniqueness. Let's come to Exodus chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 1. When you spoke about Aaron, it's not just like, you know, you pour oil on just anybody. This one is unique. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet, thy mouthpiece. You get revelation from heaven, and then you give it to Aaron, and he, like a faithful prophet, will not diminish or add to anything you tell him. He'll tell Pharaoh, and he'll tell him faithfully. He'll tell him of, uh, fearlessly. Then it says, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he sent the children of Israel out of his land. You see there the uniqueness of Aaron. And you'll see later that everything we're talking about today concerning Aaron is unique. And the unity we want, we want to see, that the Lord wants to see in his church, is unique. It's not unity like a secret cult. It's not unity like in a society. It's not unity like a political party. It's not unity like a denomination. It's not unity like a group of people that go into a satanic covenant, special, specific, unique kind of unity. We're looking at 1 Samuel, and I'm reading from chapter 12, verse 6. Chapter 12 of 1 Samuel, verse 6. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers 
out, up out of the land of Egypt. He said, Aaron, as we're talking about, of course, we know about Moses, but as we're talking about Aaron, it is the Lord that advanced Aaron. This one is unique. This one is special. Hebrews chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 4. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4. The uniqueness of excelling leadership. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself. This is not what somebody can just jump into among the children of Israel. If Aaron can do it, I can do it. Not this one. This is not something that somebody would say, I'm as wise as Aaron. I'm as intelligent as Aaron. And I'm as available as Aaron. I can do this, not this one. It says, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. Special and unique. Now let's come back to Exodus chapter 28 and see what it says about the provisions made for Aaron. Exodus chapter 28, and I read from verse 1, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me, that he, Aaron, may minister unto me. It's not like somebody choosing a profession, somebody choosing an occupation, somebody choosing something, you know, he wants to do by himself. And he says, I appoint myself, I have this goal, I have this vision, and this is what I want to do. This one is unique. This one is special. And this one is a definite call that came from heaven, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Itama, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make them holy garments. The garments were unique. As we read in Psalm 133, he poured the oil, the ointment, and it went from the head to the beard and to the garments. These are special garments recommended by God himself. Everything about this is unique. That's what we're talking about, the precious uniqueness of excelling leadership. It says, for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Verse 3, and thou shalt speak unto the children, unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garment to consecrate him. That they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Look at verse 4. And these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and broidered coat and matter and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And so you understand, this is not the choice of Aaron, special and unique. I'm reading from verse 12. And I shall put the two stones upon the shoulder of the effort for stones for memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. The names of the tribes of the children of Israel are imprinted into those stones that are put on the shoulders of the garment. And then he tells us in verse 29, Verse 29, it says, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment 
upon his heart when he goes in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. He wouldn't have the chance of saying, I want to change my garments. It's becoming too stale. It's becoming too common. It's becoming too well known to the people. This one was unique for service and unique for ministry. I'm reading from verse 36. In verse 36, here is what it says. And thou shalt make a pledge of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet holiness unto the Lord. That shows us the conclusion of why such a garment was made and what purpose God had in having that garment upon him. Come to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. As ministers and leaders, we need to understand the Bible, not just read it superficially like, you know, some of our members may do. We need to know and understand the word better than our members. In um, Exodus chapter 30, verse 22, Moreover, the Lord said unto Moses, saying, what did he say? Verse 25, And thou shalt make each an oil of holy ointment. This is the ointment of spot upon his head and upon his garment and upon the tabernacle and upon him entirely. An ointment compound, a compound after or compounded after the arch of the apothecary. It shall be an holy ointment, anointing oil. Come to the statue. In verse 30, it says, And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Everything is centered on ministering unto the Lord. Then he goes on in verse 31, And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil, unto me throughout your generations. As long as Aaron was alive, as long as the priesthood of Aaron was alive, this oil was specifically made for his anointing. You couldn't pour it on any other person, on any other set of people. And then it goes on to say, in verse 32, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. It's unique, it's special. It's just for the consecration. It's just for the anointing. And it's just for the setting apart of this high priest Aaron. And it says, upon man's flesh it shall not be poured. Neither shall, shall ye make any other like it. It was a serious sin among the children of Israel. You will not make any similar ointment, anointing like it for any other purpose. It says, after the composition of it, it is holy and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever, verse 33, whosoever compounds any like it, or whosoever putteth any of feet upon a stranger shall even be cut off from his people. That's the ultimate we're talking about. That's the anointing we're talking about. That's what you read about in Psalm 133, that this one is special, that this one is unique. And it's referring to the unity. And it says the unity we have is not the unity we borrow from a cult. It's not the unity we borrow from the world. It's not the unity we borrow from a political party. It's not the unity we borrow from a religious denomination. This one is unique and this one is special. It's just like the ointment that came upon Aaron that was poured upon his head and that flows through to his garment in the unity that is made or composed in heaven. It's unity compounded from heaven as the Father art in me and I and the Father that 
they may have that kind of heavenly unity and that kind of unique unity. That's what the Lord is talking about. We're coming to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 8. Leviticus chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 8. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8, it tells us about this uh, uh, Aaron's, uh, Aaron's uh, anointing and Aaron's ointment that was poured upon him and his office and his calling. Very, very unique. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine. That anointing comes upon you, and you are selected, you are chosen, you are set apart. And the anointing is unique, and you are not to be like other people in the land. It says, do not drink wine, nor strong drink thou, nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation. Lest she die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put a difference between the holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, that she may teach the children of Israel. That she may teach the children of Israel. You have a special calling. You have a unique calling. And you have a special anointing and a unique consecration so that you'll teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, and I read from verse 1. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil only, beating for the light, to cause the lambs to burn continually. It is part of the reason you have the oil that was compounded, that was composed, that was made, that they'll put in the light and the lamps in the tabernacle, and it will burn continually. And it says, without the veil of the testimony, this verse 3, and in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning. This was special, unique assignment for Aaron. And then it says before the Lord continually, it shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lambs upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. Remember, the Lord is talking to somebody above the age of 80. Might be in his 90s until he came to 100, until he was 110. He died at the age of 100, 123 years. And continually, until the point of his death, he will wake up in the night, he will do this. That's why the anointing came upon him. And it was unique. And if it was like that, that's what the Lord is telling us. That the unity he is talking about is like Aaron's ointment that flows all through his body and flows through the body of Christ and flows through the whole congregation. And it is not something temporary. It's not something that will terminate at a particular time. It's not something that is seasonal. Rainy season or dry season or happy season or sad season. Everything must go on all throughout the time. And I pray the Lord will grant us this understanding of the uniqueness of excelling leadership in Jesus' name. Did I hear a good, good amen? amen. We're coming back now to Psalm 133. It says, Behold, it says, Wait and see. It says, don't be in a hurry. You might see something, but you don't behold it. You don't gaze at it. You don't think of it. You don't meditate on it. It says, behold this one. How 
good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. This unity is like the precious ointment, special, unique, composed from heaven and composed in a special way and should not be applied to any day-to-day -day use and should not be allowed to be touched or used by any other person. This one is special, precious ointment, very unique upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. And that made him to be set apart and to be recognized and known that here is a special, special ministry. And the unity is talking about a special. And it is not something that in your natural effort, in your natural ability, you make that unity to come. It's something that heaven has to give us. It's something that heaven has to operate on us. And then he wants that unity to be like that ointment that goes on ever and ever and ever. Now he gives us another illustration. We're looking at point number three now. And we're looking at verse three. As the dew of Hammon. You see, talking about the unity. And it's illustrating that unity now with something, we'll say, natural. It's coming out of the temple. It's coming out of the tabernacle. It's coming away from Aaron. And it's coming now to the field. It's coming out to the illustration of nature. And it says, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, even eternal life. The perpetual usefulness unto eternal life. The dew is peculiarly useful. Useful perpetually and useful all the time. And look at the connection of the dew and the blessing. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27, and I'm reading from verse 28. Genesis chapter 27, reading from verse 28. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven. Look at that. God give thee of the dew of heaven. I saw the dew is falling for everybody. And God doesn't have to give somebody specially. This one is unique. And this one is special. And this one is peculiar. This one is talking about a special blessing you know, that will come upon Jacob. And he compares that to the dew that comes from heaven, not from the earth. It says, therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth. And plenty of corn and wine. Let the people serve thee. This talking about the dew of heaven. And it illustrates the blessing on the farm, the blessing on the field, the blessing on the family, and the blessing on the flock, and the blessing on anything he sets his hands unto. The people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. That's part of the blessing of the deal that Jacob was bringing upon, that Isaac was bringing upon Jacob. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Look at this. Look at the deal now. Cursed be everyone that curses thee. Are you hear your amen? amen? And blessed be he that blessed thee. Amen. That's the deal he was talking about when he said, deal from heaven. It says, I'm transferring the blessing of Abraham upon you, upon your life, upon your family, upon your posterity. And it refers to that as the deal of heaven. And it says it's the unity that is talking about that is like that deal from heaven that confers upon us the blessing of the Lord and the blessings of Abraham. Everything he has said concerning us, it says it's emanating, it's originating from that unity that it brings into our lives. We're coming to Exodus, and I'm reading from chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, like the deal from heaven. Exodus chapter 16, I'm reading here from verse 13. 
Exodus chapter 16, reading from verse 13. And it came to pass that at the evening the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the host. The dew, the dew. The dew that falls from heaven. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, And when the dew that lay was come up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the oar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for did we not, they knew not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. What he saw was deal. The deal came and uh, like forerunners of the manna. And as the deal lifted, they saw the manna. And he said, what is this? And he said, we don't know the name. What name are we going to give to this? This was manna, provision from heaven. And so when it says, this unity is like the deal from heaven. It's like the blessing of Abraham coming upon uh, Jacob. It is like the manna that came upon the children of Israel. It's talking about Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. And is giving to us and the deal that comes the more united we are the more together we are and the more we are in fellowship the more the power of christ the sustenance of christ the provision of christ will be in our midst because how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity that unity is like the ointment porch upon Aaron. that unity is like the deal that came upon Hammon that that came upon the hills and the mountains of Zion. It is like the manna that came up for them, and that manna was there for 40 years, and the Lord fed them. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and I'm reading from verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're reading from verse 2. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2, telling us what deal came to them. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2, My doctrine shall drop as the dew. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. When it says the dew is talking about the doctrine as well. The word, the speech that comes from the mouth of the Lord that refreshes us that renews us, that revitalizes us. It says, when before the dew comes, you know, every place is dusty. And all those plants are like a drying up. But then at night, the dew falls on them. And by the time you wake up in the morning, that's refreshing. And it says, the unity is like that. Where there's been disagreement, commotion, whatever it is, a conflict, and, uh, you know, we're drying up, and our prayers are not being answered, and uh, many, many bad things are happening. All of a sudden, we realize what has been happening. And we say, it must stop and every negative thing will stop in our families in our church say good amen. amen and then we say we understand now we clear all our conflicts and all our differences and then we unite together even the people of the world are noticing they say look at the people how pleasant how good it is for them to dwell together in unity and the dew of blessing will not begin to fall upon us and then they'll be refreshing. You're refreshed. All the dryness and the coldness and the tiredness. I cannot, I cannot. All of a sudden, we don't know it happened. Everything vanishes away. We come alive. I said we come alive. Because there is a refreshing, there is a revival, there is a revitalization, there is regeneration, there's renewal. And the power of God comes upon us in an unprecedented way. It will happen even from tonight in Jesus' name. Deuteronomy chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 13, it says, 
and of Joseph he says, Blessed be the Lord, uh, be his, his land, and uh, the, for the precious things of heaven, and for the dew, and for the deep that couches beneath. It's uh, bringing blessing Jacob. He said, now blessing uh, Joseph. And he remembered how Isaac, his father, had blessed him. And how he had prospered. How things have, you know, gone uh, very well for him because of the deal of heaven. And he loved Joseph. He was not going to bring blessing upon Joseph. And he said, of Joseph, he said, blessed uh, of the Lord, be his hand for the precious things of heaven and for the deep that uh, couches beneath and for the precious fruits br brought forth by the sun and the precious things put forth by the moon and the and, and the chief things of the ancient mountains and for the precious things of lasting hills the precious things of the lord come upon your life in jesus name and then look at verse 28 verse 28 of that same chapter and it says israel shall dwell in safety alone I'm talking about you there. You will dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine. Also, his heaven shall drop down dew. Your heaven shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord the shield of thy help, who is the sword of his excellency, thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee. And thou shalt tread upon their high places. The dew of heaven will be upon every life, upon every family. All the weariness will vanish away. Tiredness will vanish away. Curse from the enemy will vanish away. Isaiah chapter 55, and I'm reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. For the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bird, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the sin whereunto I send it. Like the rain that comes down, like the dew that comes down, the Lord will bring showers of blessing upon you. Hosea chapter 14, reading from verse 5. Hosea chapter 14, verse 5, and I will be. This is the Almighty now talking. It's going beyond just blessing upon us. It's going beyond manna, provision for the people. It's going beyond even the blessing of Abraham. He said, he himself, I will be as the deal unto Israel. And he shall grow as the lily and cast forth its roots as Lebanon. Your branches shall spread. Your beauty shall be as the olive tree, and your smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under your shadow will return. They shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. The saints thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, and you will say, what have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard him. And observed him, I am like a green fir tree. He says, From me is thy fruit found. 
from God is your fruit found. As the dew comes upon you, you are going to be fruitful. Amen. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. You will not be a transgressor. The blessings of the Lord will abide upon your life, upon your family. Like the dew from heaven, it will abide upon the work of your hand in Jesus' name. And now in Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58, I read from verse 10. And if thou draw thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as a known day. Any amen there? Yeah. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be as a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters fail not and they that be of thee shall build the old waste places thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations thou shalt be called the repairer of the bridge the restorer of paths to dwell in restoration in your life, repairing in your life, renewal in your life, refreshing in your life, and it comes as we become united together. You are going to see from today greater blessings, richer blessings, untold blessings, even unexpected blessings on every scene around you, spiritually and physically, and in your family, everywhere, in Jesus' name. You will be a wonder to behold. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of Aaron. And as the dew of Hammon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The blessings be commanded upon you. I said, the blessings be commanded upon you. Heaven's blessing commanded upon you. And from tonight, you'll experience all the answers of the prayers of the past in Jesus' name. Rise up and receive before you go. Rise up and tell the Lord, the blessings of the Lord are commanded upon you. If there's any area where you are not united with the people of God, where you are not united with you know some because of this, because of that, don't let us cheat ourselves of our blessings. Get rid of those things and remove all those things from your life and be united with the people of God in doctrine, in teaching, in lifestyle, in saying the same thing you know, and walking the walk of God together unitedly. And special blessings are coming upon every one of us from tonight in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.